Striking and imaginative is how the New York Times describes Colson Whitehead's newest book, The Underground Railroad, as it applauds his bold and startling take on the genre of historical fiction. The Underground Railroad is a metaphor, a setting, a through line, as Cora, a young woman, embarks on a hellish escape from an even more hellish life of enslavement and journeys through dark worlds that are plumbed from the author's unabashed imagination. Raised in Manhattan, Colson Whitehead has enjoyed a consistent career in writing and literature from his first job after college where he wrote reviews for The Village Voice. He is the author of the acclaimed novels The Intuitionist, John Henry Days, and Zone One, as well as one of, uh, as well as one of the nonfiction, mm -mm, starting again, as well as of the nonfiction works, The Colossus of New York and The Noble Hustle. A Pulitzer Prize finalist, a MacArthur Fellowship recipient, and a Penn Faulkner finalist, his nonfiction essays and reviews have appeared in many of America's most read and prestigious periodicals. Please join me in welcoming back Colson Whitehead. How do you do? Thanks for coming out. This is my fourth visit to the library. And I'm very honored to be back. So the book is called The Underground Railroad. And I had the idea for it uh, 16 years ago. I was winding down on my book, John Henry Days, and came across a reference to the railroad and remembered how when I was in fourth grade um, and first heard the words, I assumed it was a literal network subway uh, beneath America, which is very impractical. And my teacher, you know, quickly disabused me of that, of that notion. Uh, but I thought, but what if, you know, uh, that was actually the case, that'd be a cool premise for a novel. There's not much story there. And uh, so I quickly added the uh, complicating element that every state our hero goes through, uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, is a different state of American possibility, sort of an alternative America, what could have been, uh, what might be in a kind of Gulliver's Travels type thing. Uh, um, although it's any sort of story with the structure where a person is tested in a series of allegorical trials uh, on the way to freedom, enlightenment, home. So I knew that if I tried to write it then, I would fuck it up. Um, <laughs> but if I waited and became a better writer, wrote some other books I knew I could do, and became a more mature person, saw the world, um, got work in a tramp steamer, gone to a knife fight with a hobo or something, I would grow up and maybe bring some more wisdom to the story and do it justice. So each time I finished the book, I would uh, come back to my you know, one page of notes and think, am I ready now? And each time the answer was no. <coughs> until about two and a half years ago. And um, I had sold my editor a, a novel idea, but I was feeling a little unsure about it. So I told my wife about the story about the Underground Railroad, this idea I had. Um, you know, in your marriage, sometimes you have to make a conversation to <laughs> fill, fill the silences. And, and she said, I don't want to say that your idea about a Brooklyn writer going through a midlife crisis is dumb, per se. Um, but his Underground Railroad book sounds pretty good. So I was like, huh. And then, um, so that was one vote. So I went to my agent, who I'd been with for 18 years, and told her I had two ideas. And I told her, and she said, uh, well, they both sound good, which wasn't incredibly helpful. But then she did something she never does, and that was email me on a Sunday and to say that she kept thinking about the Underground Railroad idea, and it sounded pretty good. So I was like, huh. And um, Wednesday came, it was shrink day. So I told my shrink about the idea, <laughs> and she was like, what are you, crazy? Well, we know you're crazy, but this book sounds totally up your alley, uh, which only left my editor, to whom I'd already sold a, a book, and I told him the idea, and he just said, giddy up, motherfucker, which is publishing talk for, I think this idea is very good and we should pursue it. <laughs> so 
an old-timey publishing talk. So, <laughs> so I got to work. And in this first section, <coughs> Cora, our protagonist, is 17 or 18. And she's not sure because slave masters didn't keep track of how old their slaves were. Um, why would you keep track of an object in your house and know what day it came to your property? Um, and it's the birthday of a, a man named Jockey. Jockey is the oldest slave on the plantation, and whenever he senses a need for release, he declares that it's his birthday. And it could be once a year, twice a year, you know, two days in a row. Um, and they have a feast, and they have music, and in the midst of their hell, they have a celebration. Um, there's a reference to Caesar, who is a new arrival to the plantation. He was raised on a small farm in Virginia and was promised his whole life that once he, his owner died, he'd be set free. Um, that didn't happen. She didn't leave a will. And her niece sells him and his parents and all the furniture, the, the buggies and the couches, and he's sold down south and never sees his family again. And so when he comes to Cora's plantation, it's a much rougher experience than she's ever uh, had. Um, the plantation is run by James and Terence Randall, and the final character is Chester, who's a 10-year-old boy, also an orphan like um, Cora, and she has taken him under her wing. The music stopped, the circle broke. Sometimes a slave will be lost in a brief eddy of liberation, in the sway of, in the sway of a sudden reverie among the furrows or while untangling the mysteries of an early morning dream, in the middle of a song on a warm Sunday night. Then it comes always, the overseer's cry, the call to work, the shadow of the master, the reminder that she's only a human being for a tiny moment across the eternity of her servitude. The Randall brothers had emerged from the great house and were among them. The slaves stepped aside, making calculations of what distance represented the right proportion of fear and respect. Godfrey, James's houseboy, held up a lantern. According to old jockey, James favored the mother, stout as a barrel and just as firm in countenance, and Terence took after the father, tall and owl-faced, perpetually on the verge of swooping down on prey. In addition to the land, they inherited their father's tailor, who arrived once a month in his rickety carriage with his samples of linen and cotton. The brothers dressed alike when they were children and continued to do so into manhood. Their white trousers and shirts were as clean as the laundry girl's hands could make them. And the orange glow of the lantern made the men look like ghosts emerging from the dark. Master James, Jockey said. His good hand gripped his chair uh, as if to rise. Master Terence. Don't let us disturb you, Terence said. My brother and I were discussing business and heard the music. I told him, now that is the most god-awful racket I've ever heard. The Randalls were drinking wines, wine out of, out of goblets of cut glass and looked as if they'd drained a few bottles. Cora searched for Caesar's face in the crowd. She did not find him. He hadn't been present the last time the brothers appeared together on the northern half. You did well to remember the different lessons of those occasions. Something always happened when the Randalls ventured into the quarter, sooner or later, a new thing coming that you couldn't predict until it was upon you. James left the daily operations to his man Connolly and rarely visited. He might grant a tour to a visitor, a distinguished neighbor or planter from another neck of the woods, but it was rare. James rarely addressed his niggers, who'd been taught by the lash to keep working and ignore his presence. When Terence appeared on his brother's half of the plantation, he usually appraised each slave and made a note of which men were the most able and which women the most appealing. Content to leer at his brother's women, he grazed heartily upon the women of his own half. I like to taste my plums, he said, prowling the rows of cabins to see what struck his fancy. He violated the, violated the bonds of affection, sometimes visiting slaves on their wedding night to show the husband the proper way to discharge his marital duty. He tasted his plums and broke the skin and left his mark. 
It was accepted that James was of a different orientation. To hear his valet prideful tell it, James confined his erotic energies to specialized rooms in a New Orleans establishment. The madam was broad-minded and modern, adept in the trajectories of human desire. Prideful stories were hard to believe, despite assurances that, assurances that he received them, his reports from the staff of the place with whom he'd grown close over the years. After all, what kind of white man would willingly submit to the whip? <coughs> Terence scratched his cane in the dirt. It had been his father's cane, topped with a silver wolf's head. Many remembered its bite on their flesh. Terence said, then I recollected, recollected James, tell me about a nigger he had down here, could recite the Declaration of Independence. I can't bring myself to believe him. I thought perhaps tonight he can show me, since everyone's out and about from the sound of it. James said, we'll settle it. Where is that boy, Michael? No one said anything. Godfrey waved the lantern around pathetically. Moses was the boss, unfortunate enough to stand closest to the Randall brothers. He cleared his throat. Michael dead, Master James. Michael, the slave in question, <coughs> had indeed possessed the ability to recite long passages. According to Connolly, who heard the story from the nigger trader, Michael's former master was fascinated with the abilities of southern South American parrots and reasoned that if a bird could be taught limericks, a slave might be taught to remember as well. Merely glancing at the size of their skulls told you that a nigger possessed a bigger brain than a bird. Michael had been the son of his master's coachman, had a brand of animal cleverness, the kind you see in pigs sometimes. The master and his unlikely pupil starred with simple rhymes and short passages from popular British, British versifiers. They went slow over the words the nigger didn't understand, and if truth be told, the master only half understood. But they made miracles, the tobacco farmer and the coachman's son. The Declaration of Independence was their masterpiece. Michael's ability never amounted to more than a parlor trick, delighting visitors before the discussion turned, as it always did, to the diminished faculties of niggers. His owner grew bored and sold the boy south. By the time Michael got to Randall Plantation, some torture or punishment had addled his senses. He was a mediocre worker. He complained of noises and black spells that blotted his memory. In exasperation, Connolly beat out what little brains the man had left. It was a scourging that Michael was not intended to survive, and it achieved its purpose. I should have been told, James said, his displeasure plain. Michael's recitation had been a novel diversion the two times he trotted the nigger out for guests. Terence liked to tease his brother. James, you better keep better account of your property. Don't meddle. Terence continued. I knew you let your slave have rebels, but I had no idea they were so extravagant. Are you trying to make me look bad? Don't pretend you care what a nigger thinks about you, Terence. James's glass was empty. He turned to go. Oh, one more song, James. These sounds have grown on me. George and Wesley, the musicians, were forlorn. Noble and his tambourine were nowhere to be seen. James pressed his lips into a slit. He gestured, and the men started playing. Terence tapped his cane. His face sank as he took in the crowd. You're not going to dance? I have to insist. You and you and you. They didn't wait for their master's signal. The slaves of the, of the northern half converged on the slave alley, haltingly, trying to insinuate themselves into their previous rhythm and put on a show. Putting on a show for master was a familiar skill, the small angles and advantages of the mask. And they shook off their fear as they settled into the performance. Oh, how they capered and hollered, shouted and hopped. Certainly this was the most lively song they'd ever heard. The musicians, the most accomplished players the colored race had to offer. Cora dragged herself into the circle, checking the Randall brothers' reactions on every turn like everyone else. Jockey tumbled his hands in his lap to keep time. Cora found Caesar's face. He stood in the shadows of the kitchen, his expression flat. 
Then he withdrew. You! It was Terence. He held his hand before him as if it were covered in some eternal stain that only he could see. Then Cora caught sight of it, the single drop of red wine staining the cuff of his lovely white shirt. Chester, the boy, had bumped him. Chester simpered and bowed before the white man. Sorry, master, sorry, master. The cane crashed across his shoulder and head again and again. The boy screamed and shrank to the dirt as the blows continued. Terence's arm rose and fell. James looked tired. One drop. A feeling settled over Cora. She hadn't been under its spell in years, ever since she brought the hatchet down on Blake's doghouse and sent the splinters into the air. She'd seen men hung from trees and left for buzzards and crows, women carved open to the bones with the can of nine tails, feet cut off to prevent escape and hands cut off to stop theft. She'd seen boys and seen boys and girls younger than this beaten and had done nothing. But this night, the feeling settled over her heart again. It grabbed hold of her, and before the slave part of her caught up with the human part of her, she was bent over the boy's body as a shield. She held the cane in her hand like a swamp man handling a snake and saw the ornament at its tip. The silver wolf bared its silver teeth, then the cane was out of her hand. It came down on her head. It crashed down again, and this time the silver teeth ripped across her eyes, and her blood splattered the dirt. And that's it for that section. Thanks. Um, so there's the linear story, story is Cora. Uh, and her escape from the plantation. After that incident, conditions deteriorate, and she does go with Caesar. And she's pursued by a slave catcher named Arnold Ridgway. And this is his introduction. <coughs> Great conversations. <laughs> Arnold Ridgway's father was a blacksmith. The sunset glow of molten iron bewitched him, the way the color emerged in the stock, slow and then fast, overtaking it like an emotion, the sudden pliability and restless writhing of the thing as it waited for pur purpose. His forge was a window into the primitive energies of the world. His father had a saloon partner named Tom Bird, a half-breed who took a sentimental turn when lubricated by whiskey. On nights when Tom Bird felt separate from his life's design, he shared stories of the Great Spirit. The Great Spirit lived in all things, the earth, the sky, the animals and forests, flowing through and connecting them in a divine thread. Although Bridgeway's father scorned religious talk, Tom Bird's testimony on the Great Spirit reminded him of how he felt about iron. <coughs> He bent to no god save the glowing iron he tended in his forge. He'd read about the great volcanoes, the lost city of Pompeii, destroyed by fire that poured out of mountains from deep below. Liquid fire was the very blood of the earth. It was his mission to upset, mash, and draw out, draw out the metal into the useful things that made society operate. Nails, horseshoes, plows, knives, guns chains, working the spirit, he called it. When permitted, young Ridgeway stood in a corner while his father worked Pennsylvania iron, melting, hammering, dancing around his anvil, sweat dripping down his face, covered in soot, foot to crown, blacker than an African devil. You gotta work that spirit, boy, he'd say. One day he'd find his spirit, his father told him. Ridgway was 14 when he took up with the slave patrollers. Patrol was not difficult work. They stopped any niggers they saw and demanded their passes. They stopped niggers they knew to be free for their amusement, but also to remind the Africans of the forces arrayed against them, whether they were owned by a white man or not. It made the rounds of the slave villages in search of anything amiss, a smile or a book. 
They flogged the wayward niggers before bringing them to jail or directly to their owner if they were in the mood and it wasn't too close to quitting time. News of a runaway sent them into cheerful activity. They raided the plantations after their quarry, interrogating a host of quivering darkies. Free men knew it was coming and hid their valuables and moaned when the white men smashed their furniture and glass, praying that they can confine their damage to objects. There were perquisites, apart from the thrill of shaming a man in front, of, in front of his family or roughing up an unseasoned buck who squinted at you the wrong way. The old Mutter farm, for example, had the calmliest colored wenches. Mr. Mutter had a taste. And the excitement of the hunt put a young patroller in a lusty mood. According to some, the backwood stills of the old men on the slow, stone plantation produced the best, the best corn whiskey in the county and aroused allowed Ridgeway to replenish his jars. Ridgeway commanded his appetites in those days, withdrawing before his Confederates more egregious displays. The other patrollers were boys and men of, band, of bad character. The work attracted a type. In another country, they would have been criminals, but this was America. He liked the night work best when they lay in wait for a buck who sneaked through the woods to visit his wife on a plantation up the road, or a squirrel hunter looking to, supp su to supplement his daily meal of slop. Other patrollers carried guns and eagerly cut down any rascal dumb enough to flee, but Ridgeway, but not Ridgeway. Nature had equipped him with weapons enough. Ridgeway ran them down as if they were rabbits, and then his fists subdued them, beat them for being out, beat them for running, even though the chase was the only remedy for his restlessness, charging through the dark, branches lashing his face, stumps sending him ass over elbow before he got up again. In the chase, his blood sang and glowed. And eventually he moves up from slave patrol to slave catcher, moving out of state to uh, bring fugitives back home. New York was the start of a wild time. Ridgeway worked retrieval, heading north when Constable sent word they'd captured a runaway from Virginia or North Carolina. New York became a frequent destination, and after exploring new aspects of his character, Ridgeway picked up stakes. The fugitive trade back home was straightforward, <coughs> knocking heads. Up north, the, the gargantuan metropolis, the liberty movement, and the ingenuity of the colored community all converged to portray the true scale of the hunt. He was a quick study. It was more like remembering than learning. Sympathizers and mercenary captains smuggled fugitives to the city ports, and in turn, stevedores and dock hands and clerks furnished him with information, and he scooped up the rascals on the threshold of deliverance. Freemen informed on their African brothers and sisters, comparing the, des the descriptions of runaways in the gazettes with the furtive creatures slinking around the colored churches, saloons, and meeting houses. Ridgeway fell in with a circle of slave catchers, gorillas stuffed into black suits with ridiculous derbies. He had to prove he was not a bumpkin, but just once. Together they shadowed the runaways for days, hiding outside places of work until opportunity announced itself, breaking into their Negro hovels at night to kidnap them. After years away from, from the plantation, after taking a wife and starting a family, they had convinced themselves that they were free, as if owners forgot about property. Their delusions made them easy prey. He snubbed the black birders, the Five Points gangs who hogtied free men and dragged them south for auction, that was low behavior, patroller behavior. He was a slave catcher now. When Ridgeway waited at the docks for smugglers, the magnificent ships from Europe dropped anchor and discharged their passengers. Everything they owned in sacks, half starving, hapless as niggers by any measure. But they'd be called to their proper places as he had been, his whole world growing up in the South was a ripple of this first immigrant arrival. This dirty white flood had nowhere to go but out, south, west. The same laws govern garbage and people. 
The gutters of the city overflowed with refuse, but the mess found its place in time. Ridgeway watched them stagger down the gangplanks, roomy and bewildered, overcome by the city. The possibilities lay before these pilgrims like a banquet, and they'd been so hungry their whole lives. They'd never seen the likes of this, but they'd leave their mark on this new land as surely as those famous souls at Jamestown, making it theirs through unstoppable racial logic. If niggers were supposed to have their freedom, they wouldn't be in chains. If the red man was supposed to keep hold of his land, it would still be his. If the white man wasn't destined to take this new world, he wouldn't own it now. Here was the true great spirit, its divine thread connecting all human endeavor. If you can keep it, it's yours, your property, slave or continent, the American imperative. Ridgway gathered renown with his facility for ensuring that property remained property. When a runway took off down an alley, he knew where the man was headed, <coughs> the direction and aim. His trick, don't speculate where the slave is headed next. Concentrate instead on the idea that he's running away from you, not from a cruel master or the vast agency of bondage, but you specifically. It worked again and again, his own iron fact, in alleys and pine barrens and swamps. He finally left his father behind and the burden of that man's philosophy. Ridgeway was not working the spirit. He was not the smith rendering order, not the hammer, not the anvil. He was the heat. Thank you. With regard to Cora, I know most of your protagonists tend to be male. Did you think was, it, was that the voice you heard? Were you creating Cora from the get-go, or did you think you couldn't hang this one on uh, a male sensibility, or? Well, for, you know, <coughs> sorry, I'm getting over a cold. Um, for year, you know, over the years, I had the idea in the back of my head, it was the main character was a man running by himself, a man looking for his spouse or a child, uh, looking for his wife over the years, and then you know, one of the original inspirations was the story of Harriet Jacobs, who wrote a famous slave narrative. And um, she ran away from her master in North Carolina and spent seven years in an attic until she could get passage out of her, her town. And that, there's an echo of that in the North Carolina chapter. Um, so that, one, you know, that was one of the first slave narratives I encountered. And um, in the early part of that book, she mentions how when she hits puberty, 14, she enters into the worst uh, stage, stage of all for a slave girl, and that's when you're supposed to now breed and pump out babies, because more babies are more money, and more hands to pick cotton, more cons, more money, more slaves to sell, and that's when you get inducted into uh, being sexual prey for your master, or other slaves, and into the economic engine. And so I had had, had a string of male protagonists, and um, you know I'm always trying to mix it up in different ways, and so it seemed, because of the inspiration of Harriet Jacobs, the unique or differently terrible situation of how female slaves are treated, and having had a string of male protagonists, it was time to mix it up with this book. Hello, congratulations on the glowing reviews I've read. And as you read from this wonderful book, I see a film, so, have you signed a contract yet? Hollywood? I have not um, signed a contract. There was some interest, and uh, there's a filmmaker being named Barry Jenkins who's working with Plan B, a production company, to get money to make it into a miniseries, like eight, eight episodes. It's not really a movie. It's too long, and you have to you know, reboot it every half hour. Um, so if they get money, they're like, can we just take it out and show people and maybe get money? And I'm like, sure. Um, so I haven't signed anything, and nothing's come my way yet. But if they can find a partner who will under underwrite it, who knows? <laughs> yes, Sam, let's see. Yeah, right in the center here, there's a lady with her hand up. Hi. Hey, the mic's coming to you. Hi, thank you for your book. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the research you did um, behind this book? Thank you. Sure. Um, uh, I'm pretty a pretty lazy guy, so if I can uh, download stuff, I'm always excited. And 
a lot, all the slave narratives are in the public domain. Um, so uh, sort of classics I read in college, I revisited. There's a, a really good history of the Underground Railroad I read called Bound for Canaan by Fergus Bordewich. It came out about eight years ago. And that was my first introduction to how it all worked. And so I still think of that as like my main source on how the railroad works. The railroad in the book is not really how it operated, and, but it was very useful for time and setting and political pressures. And then my main thing was, um, apart from the classic slave narratives, were the oral testimonies collected by the government in the 1930s, the Works Progress Administration. Trying to get people back to work, the Great Depression, hire writers to interview former slaves, people who had been kids or teenagers at the time of the Civil War. And there are hundreds and hundreds of them from Tennessee, from Georgia, and um, <coughs> some of them are just two paragraphs long and give a mundane description of how, how they farmed. Some are about working in the house versus the field. Um, but it gave me a real sense of the variety of uh, the slave experience, whether it was in a high cotton state or an indigo plantation or a small farm. And uh, I had anxiety about, you know, I mean, you write something that's historical, as the first section is, the first 60 pages, you want to get it right. And all the details, the slang, uh, the nouns I wanted that you know, make the book hopefully live, mostly came from those narratives and the slave narratives. I thoroughly enjoyed your book. Oh, thank you. Um, some of your white characters are mean, downright evil. I mean, and you writing about a very, very dark period in American history. How do you transition out of that very dark, dark world? I mean, you write a page a day. Um, <laughs> you seem to be a very happy man. Sure. <laughs> Just, I mean, if you can, can you understand where I'm? Sure, yeah. <coughs> um, of course, I had an idea of how bad slavery was. Um, doing research anew in my mid-40s reacquainted me in a newer way with how terrible it was. And then, uh, was it like I have children now? Was it like, what would it have been like to see them sold off, beaten, uh, raped, tortured, have them see the same thing happen to me? Um, and then thinking about my own family who exist in some pre-1900 void of slavery. I don't know where they, I know where they came from originally. Uh, I don't know where they lived and died in America and um, what kind of places they worked. But um, in order to be honest with their experience and depict the reality of slavery before I go into the more fantastic bits in the book, I was going to have to have a really brutal plantation. And that was very distressing and, and um, very upsetting. I hadn't put a character through the kinds of things I put Cora through. Um, when I started writing, you know, the voice came quickly and I was able to find that, that place between being engaged with the material and uh, being in there with them enough so that the characters live and their situation seems real realistic and plausible and credible, but also a part so that you're shaping it as an artist. You know, you have to be sort of in it and also a part. Um, so I found, once I started writing and wrote the first six page chapter about Cora's mother, Ajari, coming to America and dying on the Randall Plantation. Uh, the sort of distance of the material, um, uh, I found a distance that I've worked. And, uh, you know, at 3 p.m., I just leave my office and, should I make uh, chicken shawarma tonight for the family? Or do you go shopping for food ingredients and then uh, you make dinner and, you, you know, your family comes home and you're you put work behind you. Um, so I had that, that distance and it worked for a long time until about, I was about 100, 100 pages through. And I put off watching 12 Years a Slave because I didn't want to get infected. And I was like, oh, well, maybe I'll find some weird historical detail like a leather vest or something, you know, something I could put in uh, now that I, or I was good and going or whatever. And I, I couldn't watch it, I couldn't watch it. You know, I'll watch Texas Chainsaw. Um, <laughs> Two visits ago, we, for Zone 1, my book about the zombie apocalypse, we watched uh, Night Living Dead here. It was a really nice, really nice special day. Uh, I remember doing that. Um, so I watched a glorious horror movie. I don't care. Heads cut off, whatever. 
Um, but I couldn't watch human actors going through what I was putting on the page every day. It was just too, it was too crazy to see human reactions. Um, so I still haven't seen it. I saw the first hour. I didn't get any, anything from it uh, except that, uh, uh, well, I thought I had a good distance. Obviously, you know, um, seeing a human face was too close. I, um, I wonder whether or not when you came across the um, history of Sarah Jenkins, whether you saw any parallels between Anne Frank and her experience and Sarah Jenkins, and if you could speak a little about that. And then secondly, I just throw a little extra question. Um, our young people are not being taught how to read cursive writing anymore. Do you see that as being an impeditive um, impediment um, as they go forward in, in being able to acquaint themselves with the history of relatives and ancestors and things like that? Sure. Um, uh, tiny brain, the first question was Harriet Jacobs and uh, the parallels between Harriet Jacobs and Anne Frank. Yeah, I mean, when you hear hiding in an attic, you think of Anne Frank. Um, and by leaving the, hist the true historical uh, record, I'm allowed to make, move things around and have a conversation with different parts of history. And so um, how can I link um, uh, a white separatist state in America, like Oregon, which was founded as a white separatist state, with uh, um, some severe Jim Crow laws, in the South after the war and lynching and make a parallel between the black, black oppression and Jewish oppression in Nazi Germany. And so um, by not saying the facts, I can get to a larger truth. And that does, and in the North Carolina section where they've come to a final solution to the Negro problem by um, abolishing the, legal, the, the Negro and any black who's caught outside will, will be lynched. Um, I'm allowed to make parallels between American oppression of the other and German oppression of the other and fine linkages. Um, so that's, you know, that's you know, what the book is about is it's not just about an escaped slave, it's about race and oppression in different times and, and places. And by playing, with, by having that, that fantastic element where I can take some of the language of Nazi Germany and um, uh, white separatist literature that is after 1850, which is the timeline of the book, um, I can make a larger point uh, about oppression. So, And your second question, um, uh, the failure, failure of educational system always continues. Uh, uh, we do what we can. Thank you. Um, I was really glad that you started your first response about Harriet Jacobs and then you alluded to 12 Years a Slave because I see your book as um, part of a larger neo-slave narrative movement among African American cultural <laughs> production. And I just wanted to know if you could sort of offer some thoughts on whether or not that movement of neo-slave narratives function as a counter-narrative to a, a larger American amnesia about slavery? Sure, I mean, I think um, uh, we've had shows like, like, uh, like Underground, a reboot of Roots. Um, I haven't seen them. I definitely, I finished the book last December and I was really slavery out. And it'll be a while before I see some of the new, um, the new, uh, takes on history. I think we're going through a moment where, while there, we always need more black voices, whether they're in fiction or in TV or film, um, I think music we're doing okay. Um, uh, as time goes on, there's more people working, and, and that means more of us are gonna attack, eventually attack all history. And so uh, more people in their 20s and 30s and 40s finding their voices, getting money for projects, uh, um, making that first project out of film school, and um, I guess Birth of a Nation's coming out, it's about Nat Turner. How come there hasn't been a Nat Turner movie before this? Because there's no one who's gonna pony up for it, and there weren't enough of us, frankly, making movies and, and writing, writing them uh, that would get made to have it come out. And so, um, uh, you know, I think it's a, a slow process, but as we, we get more artists, 
uh, out there and they're cultivated and they're bringing more people up with them as uh, directors of photography and key grips and you get this you know, extension of um, black cultural productivity, um, you are gonna have that Harriet Jacobs biopic, uh, Harriet Tubman, uh, Nat Turner biopic because no one's been able to do it before and, and all the stories are just sitting there. So. You describe the state of a black-white relationship. It seems to be a very difficult one to transition away from. It will take years and years. Are you optimistic that uh, the time will come soon that the relationship will become a completely harmonious one? I'm sort of understanding uh, the question, but I think in terms of progress, uh, it's always it's always very slow. We're slow-witted, dim-witted human beings, and uh, it takes a while for information to sink in. And so, um, uh, is the election of Barack Obama that it uh, inaugurates some new golden age of post-raciality where we're all just kind of happy and going, it's great? No, but it is progress. Um, did it unleash like hidden nativist, racist uh, uh, energies in the culture? Yes. And then you get that dialectic, and and you uh, uh, you're two steps forward, and you know, and uh, a couple back. And so. Um, I have to be optimistic because uh, I would like to see my children and their friends and younger folks uh, grow up in a better world than I did in the same way that my parents hoped that I would have more opportunities than they had and their grandparents. Um, so you, you have to have hope and that's part of what the book is about. I mean, if you're born into hell, what makes you take that courageous step off a plantation? You have to have a, a hope that there is a better place out there um, a place of refuge in the north. Uh, you don't know what it looks like, but you have to believe in it or else you would never uh, take, that, take that leap. And so, I'll get there. One of the things I've always enjoyed in your writing is um, in The Intuitionist and in John Henry Days, and this is the, and I haven't re I've read the New York Times excerpt, but I haven't read this whole novel, is um, you're using kind of machinery as a metaphor. I just kind of find kind of an ironic humor that's kind of in the way that you use machinery. You know, I get on elevators now and I'm still, I always think of the intuition as so. I don't know if you've touched on it, but if you could speak about that. Sure, I mean, I think that's during the intuitionist with elevators and John Henry Day, John Henry Day is with the railroad. Um, I haven't figured out how it works. <laughs> Sorry, how it works with this book, um, strangely. Um, in those first two examples, the machine is occasioning, uh, giving birth to different metaphors. Uh, I, was, I was just gonna write about an elevator inspector who had to become a detective, and then you think about uplift, social uplift, uplift, and there's a kind of migration and meaning that allowed me to get a lot of metaphors out of it. Um, with uh, John Henry Days, uh, the railroads connect the nation, information highway in 1996 uh, connects us in different ways. And so just writing about John Henry and the technology in the 1870s and the great movement to connect different coasts with the railroad um, becomes a, makes a natural parallel with the information superhighway. And our, our protagonist is an information age John Henry put in opposition with the industrial age, John Henry. So um, with this book, you know, I'm sort of, I haven't figured out how it, how it works in the end. I mean, uh, the states are more important than the actual tracks. And so, they're, and so I could have spent 10 pages describing Cora on the tracks going from uh, Georgia to South Carolina. Instead, it's like a page and that, um, that period underground until you get to the final trip is um, really a doorway and not a tunnel. So, um, so, so definitely I was able to generate, generate metaphors out of mechanisms 20 years ago and I feel that this one is different but I haven't figured out how to articulate it yet. <laughs> uh, 
I just want to know, uh, what do you think the difference is between good writing and great writing? Um, uh, the difference between good, good writing and, and great writing. I guess good writing is like, oh, that's, um, I really enjoyed that, and it was not a waste of my time. Great writing is like, oh, I'm such a fuck up, you know, like, um, if only I just like read more, I'd become a better writer, or, you know. So, the recognition that someone is doing something that's totally beyond what you could ever conceive of, and you have no idea how they did it, and you're totally envious, and you reread it, and totally, like, worship them if they come into the room. Thank you for Cora. I loved how she grew and found a voice and finally transcended so that we have a hopeful ending. In a way, yes, yes. yes. No, we'll talk about the ending, but yeah. In a way. <laughs> but my, my question is this, and I don't want to give anything away. Just hearing you read, and I hope you're making an audio book out of this. We could listen to you read all night. But I, I heard that the cane that parents use this to hit Cora was as if it were a snake in a swamp. And then I think of her mother. Okay. No, but I want to know, is it intentional? Okay. I can't respond to that question because it's, you know, has to do with the very end of the book. So, some things when you write, it is intentional. And sometimes it's a happy accident. And then sometimes just 20 years later, you look at something and it's like, oh, did I you know, remember if it was on purpose or not? So, Another great conversation, Colson Whitehead. Thank you. <laughs>